my dudes what's happening man this is trent and uh today i want to answer a question that came in through the discord and uh yeah that's right aquatic moon has a discord and you can follow the link below the video it's in every video underneath every video i have a link to our discord and i hang out there at least i pop in for a few minutes just about every day when i got a little bit of time this question came in from the kalinguin and uh, the Kalinguin wants to know, I'd like to see a video from you on world building. Uh, perhaps you could share your process and how in your art you portray the more expansive world. And hey, I'm gonna be drawing some buildings from the, the World of Twilight Monk Volume 2 art book that I'm working on right now for some humble little homes that are on the island of Crescent Isle. I thought that this would be a very appropriate topic for just such a painting. Now I've been a, a world building concept artist on a lot of big AAA video games that you've probably heard of. So I know a few things about it. I learned a lot along the way, you know, uh, it is, I'd say it's about 17 years I've been doing it. And so I've got a few ideas on things that I, I could help you with some things that maybe you want to consider or think about when you're designing an environment. These are just things that I think about uh, to put myself into the space so I can imagine what it's like to live there, to be amongst the people of the environments that I'm designing. And you know what? I have talked about this many times over. I talked about this at a lot of my workshops. This is kind of the primary thing that I get hired to do. So it's the primary thing that people ask me to explain. So about every six months, I do another video like this. And I don't mind. I got into it because I like it, you know? As an artist, as a, as a world builder, there's nothing more rewarding than creating an environment, creating a world that feels alive, that other players get to experience, that players get to walk through and interact with NPCs and buy things from the shop and they get a subliminal unconscious story that they're not even aware that they're getting, but the world feels convincing and alive. And there's a trick to that. There's a trick to making the player feel that. Now, when you get assigned uh, uh, to design, say like, for example, buildings. Now in this video, you're gonna watch me design my own buildings. And I've got a backstory for what these characters who live in this, this island of Crescent Isle, the way that they live and, and what they're all about. And, you know, everything down to the shape language and everything down to the construction and the materials have to support that story. And this is true everything down to the interior of a house, for example. You know, everything from what kind of materials everything is built out of to the kind of symbols that you see written on the walls, the kind of uh, shapes that stones might be carved into, the style of statues that they're building. You know, it all represents what they value. And so I start with that. I start with uh, what kind of, uh, one, what level of technology these people are at? Are they even human? If they're not human, you know, what other needs might they have? Because we know what humans need. Humans need uh, food, water, shelter. You need to, as, a, as an environment designer, uh, as a concept artist, you have to think about those things. You have to think about how the people who live there are surviving and getting by. And furthermore, the shape language of what you're doing also really impacts that, that story that you're subliminally telling the viewer. So for example, having a lot of curved doorways, you know, implies a, a more friendly kind of an environment. It's more welcoming. Curves generally are more welcoming and comfortable, whereas spikes and sharp corners are generally more hostile and aggressive. So this is certainly not Mordor. And because we're seeing things like carts and barrels, we can pretty, pretty safely assume that this is like a farming community that's a little bit more closer to a Hobbiton than a, uh, a Mordor, just to use uh, Lord of the Rings as an example. Furthermore, you're not seeing bars on windows. You're seeing they leave their goods out. So it's like there's probably a very low level of crime in this environment. Kind of feels charming, kind of feels welcoming, kind of feels safe. Every little piece that was added by either myself or somebody on my Aquatic Moon team, every little piece that's added into this scene supports that narrative that this is a pretty cozy, safe little traditional fantasy village. You can see that there's a little mailbox out front of this place. So that kind of implies that they have some kind of a mailing system, you know, in, in this uh, world and in this environment. And that implies a lot about the world outside of this island as well, that it is a somewhat modern civilization, but we're also not seeing motor carriages or highly advanced technology. You know, we're not seeing machines at work here. We're not seeing an air conditioner stuck into the wall. You know, that tells you something about the story, about the location. On a simpler scale, you can ask yourself the question of how do the people who are living or using this space interacting with it? Are they sleeping here? You know, if they are, they're, they're gonna need a sleeping space. Where would they get their blankets? Do they 
they store them really neatly or is it something that's rather scattered you know or are they just using whatever they got old horse blankets and things like that on a structural level when you look at these two rooftops of these two structures I mean one has an all wooden roof which implies that they have access to a forest nearby so they're using a lot of wood and then they also use a lot of sort of a white kind of a stone which implies that uh, you know they're probably if you have a, a, a rock face or uh, walls you know large boulders and things like that they're probably going to be made out of the same stone and they're going to build their buildings out of that stone and in some cases even shape the rooftops you know using that stone but they also have some metal work here so that that does imply a certain level of technology that maybe these buildings have been here for a really long time and there are a few modern additions that they've made to to make it uh, to make it a little bit more comfortable for themselves the stone structure also implies that maybe at one point this place would have been under siege, uh, but it's much more peaceful now because we have hanging plants. We have hanging frail looking uh, lantern uh, holders, for example, and that's not something you would have in a place that's constantly still under siege. Every single prop that you put into your scene is important. Everything from the style of, of jars that you have laying around to the, the shovels and the gardening equipment that you might have scattered about, all of that communicates more and more of the story. And when people are just looking around through it, if you help them to just get lost in that world, they can almost imagine somebody walking around and watering those, those uh, taters. Decoration, when you see things like a very highly decorated, uh, ornate pattern over a doorway or something, decorative elements imply a sophistication. It implies a society that has leisure time. They have time to actually craft something rather than just make it for a functional purpose. Every single one of these decisions adds to the overarching story that you're trying to tell. And you're dancing between all these things so much that you might forget something like, oh, maybe that watering bucket is just a little too big, for example, <laughs> which I'm noticing now as I'm editing. Yeah, don't forget to watch the scale of things. And I get lost in this stuff. I, I like, I imagine the kid who lives here, who's just like, I want to go hang out on the upstairs floor and, and like yell out to my buddies across, across the alleyway you know, to talk to my buddies and send them messages along wires down to like the old man who's just like, well, we've got extra boards here and I got no place to put them. So I guess I'll just throw them over the fence, the stone fence here. When in doubt, I think about the function of the building and I think about what a person would do with that that space. So I think about what they would do when they're trying to have leisure time. I think about what they're, they're, how they're spending their time interacting with the environment when they're just doing what it is that the function of the building is supposed to be used for. Think of it like a world for the Sims. Let's say that you just planted down a character into that world. How are they going to interact with it? There's your list of props. There's your list of things to put into that space. When you're ready to get more advanced, give them more advanced wants and needs and desires. I always loved the old Star Wars movies because it implied a worn universe. Well, I mean, I like the movies because of the awesome stories and great drama. But when I think about that world, I think something that really helped me to get lost in that world was that it was so much of an aged universe, you know? It was so alive. It had such a history. Ships that had been in war had like blaster fire all over. And then they'd like slap on some more plates of metal to like hold the thing together and they'd use mixed up parts and it kind of felt like this whole world was alive and it had been through a lot and i love that i love implying things like that in every design that i do like everything has a history being a good concept artist i think requires that you're a little bit of a storyteller and a little bit of a writer every painting is a novel every painting is a dramatic three-act play you know and you're just catching up on a moment within all of that so let's say that you're designing a house, okay? Well, imagine that we're in act three and we're looking at, you know, how they repaired the damage to the house that happened in act one. And you might be thinking, well, what damage? Well, you just made that up, but you get to elaborate on that story, okay? Let's say that it was like a magical blast that left half of the building frozen. Well, geez, that's interesting, you know? Like that makes us wonder about what happened and it makes us wonder about how they might have still lived there. And that shouldn't be an intimidating thing. That should be a fun exploration. Every step of everything I just described isn't something you should be making a list if you're writing all this down. It's like throw that list out and just ask questions. If you're gonna write anything down, write down the list of questions. What do the people who live here need? What do they value the most? How do they survive? How do they hunt? How do they feed? How do they sleep? How do they get down? 
Do they have enemies? Do they sell something? Do they get money? Do they have currency? How do they transport information? How do they get water from the river to or whatever to their their home? How rare is that water? How rare are their resources? What materials do they have in their environment to construct the things that they use to survive, to handle all of those challenges and problems? How big are their families? What's their biggest threat? How do they protect themselves from their biggest threat? All of this goes into it. And then on top of all of that, you also have to think about game design. Now, I didn't talk about that because that just branches off into way too many possible variables, but you sometimes do have to think about the limitations of gameplay. In some games, you can't have elevations and that would affect your designs. So I can go on about this for hours. In fact, I do in my workshops. If you're very interested in doing a walk along workshop with me. I do have the advanced facility concept art workshop that uh, is a is a full fledged homework based uh, workshop that'll walk you through the whole process of designing a facility. And then I also have one for a Diablo three dark fantasy kind of environment. If, if you're serious about getting into doing environment concept art for games, there's a lot of shortcuts in there and a lot of exercises that'll help you to improve your environments. You can check out my Twitter for a lot of testimonials from people who've done the workshops and uh, usually really solid, a lot of five-star reviews on those. So check those out. You can use the code on the screen above for a sweet little discount. Also, I wanna mention that over on the Discord, we're doing a monthly concept art challenge. This month, we're redesigning the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild shrines that are ugly in game. We're making it better. Anyway, so head on over to the Discord, sign up for that, the link's in the description below. And dudes, I wanna thank you so much for stopping by. It is always a pleasure, and it's certainly extremely awkward when you don't come by. I mean, it's lonely. And yes, leave a comment. I still read all of them. I still read every single comment, even the nasty ones, which are few and far between. And until next time, dudes, I'll catch you all. Manyan de Ciao, baby. Oh, yeah.